Welcome, everybody. I'd like to welcome uh, the McGill and Université de Montréal community to this very exciting uh, lecture today, and especially to welcome Dr. Kathleen Wessa, who is a physician scientist in the Integrative Medicine Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She received her medical degree from the University of Minnesota School of Medicine, followed by an internal medicine residency and rheumatology fellowship. In addition, she received a, a Bush Medical Fellowship and a National Institute of Health National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine Postdoc Research Fellowship in Complementary Therapies and Clinical Research. As a specialist in integrative medicine, Dr. Wessa combines evidence-based complementary therapies with mainstream care for cancer patients to manage their cancer-related symptoms. She's actively involved in studies investigating the scientific basis of complementary therapies and has lectured throughout the U.S. and India, Europe, and Asia. Her primary research interests include vitamin D, medicinal mushrooms, botanical therapies, and the mind-body therapies of self-hypnosis, meditation, and yoga. Dr. Wessa also is a reviewer for the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Therapies, the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, Cancer, and the Journal of the Society for Integrative Oncology. And it's my personal delight and pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I want to thank Mary and the organizing committee for their kind invitation to come today and, and speak with you. Right. So, um, this is our outline. We'll first start about uh, things between alternative and complementary therapies, uh, different bogus cancer treatments, botanicals, antioxidant supplements, and then our, our uh, website. Okay, so the, the terms alternative and complementary, these are thrown around, but they are actually two very different terms. Uh, alternative therapies are things that are used instead of mainstream treatments for cancer and for other serious illnesses, and they're usually very biologically invasive, they're costly, and they're potentially harmful if for no reason other than the fact that they don't work. And so if patients will say, well, you know, I'm not going to do the, the treatment that you're recommending, I'm going to try this alternative treatment, whether it be detoxing or whatever it would be, and then we all know that the earlier that the patients can present and, and to get appropriate treatment, the better the chances of having a successful outcome. So if, if they're delaying their treatment by using these other therapies, by the time that they realize that the therapies haven't worked, the treatment has grown and multiplied and is at a much more advanced stage, and so it's uh, more difficult to have an appropriate uh, outcome. The complementary therapies, on the other hand, are used with mainstream care for cancer and other serious illnesses. They are not to treat the cancer itself. They're to treat either the side effects associated with the cancer or with the cancer treatments. They're non-invasive, they're inexpensive, safe, evidence-based, and most important, they're rational. Okay. So the complementary therapies, these things, they reduce side effects, and they also enable self-care and self-control, especially at a time when things can seem to be careening out of patients' control and they feel very helpless. The complementary therapies give back a sense of control for them, and it's, it can be very, very beneficial. They also enhance well-being and quality of life. They strengthen the body to maximize the treatment through the rigors of, of the, the cancer uh, treatment. They reduce fear, distress, depression, and anxiety. And like I said before, they're safe, non-invasive, inexpensive, and very easy to use. And our patients find that when they come to the Integrative Medicine Center, they're, they're really, you know, they enjoy our therapies and they look forward to them. Okay, so in integrative medicine and integrative oncology, we combine the best of both complementary care as well as with mainstream. Our integrative medicine service at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is set up like any other service that you would have. We have clinical services, both inpatient and outpatient. We have research, we have education and training, and then also informational programs like our website. So bogus cancer treatments in the U.S., and it's the same in Canada. It's a situation similar to that in any other developed country. It's a lucrative business, and they really prey on patients who are vulnerable. And the oncology population is, it, I do consider them a vulnerable population. Is they're facing a potentially life-threatening disease, and they may want to do, you know, anything that's possible. Um, greed is a great motivator, and there's a lot of money to be made on these uh, products, and so there's a lot of marketing. And 
They often um, uh, reflect some aspect of scientific work, but most of the marketing is, uh, is, um, uses a lot of meaningless medical jargon and is nonsense. If you Google alternative in cancer in the internet in 0.2 seconds, you're going to get many, many million hits, and most of it is just nonsense. And all of this is marketing. A lot of it is through multi-level marketing schemes. You know, it's very... Uh, very, very detrimental, and it's cloaked in a lot of anti-establishment rhetoric. Usually they talk about big pharma or, you know, the, the um, major medicine, you know, as, as suppressing them. The uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration has uh, a handout on online cancer fraud. It is such a problem. I hand, give this special handout to all my new patients when they come in, list different websites that are uh, different resources, things that you can look for. Uh, Okay, and talk to your patients about the seven signs of voodoo medicine, okay, and voodoo science, which is what, what you see a lot. Um, and these are, the first num number one, the patient pitches the claim directly to the media. These are these infomercials, okay, that you'll find on the website or in ads or you, in um, any of the health food stores. They may have huge displays or um, have the, uh, um, the salespeople um, recommend these things. They also, like I said, they claim a powerful establishment is suppressing their work. I said usually big pharma. The effect is at the very limit of detection, you know, so it's very, very small changes that you can find with their products. Uh, th this is a big one, number four. The evidence is anecdotal. They have a lot of testimonials on their, their website and in their advertisements. And so I tell my patients, if you see a testimonial, turn and run in the other direction. Don't walk, but run. And do not use the product. Testimonial means nothing. You know, and what they don't say is that many of the, the people who are giving these testimonials are actually paid, so they're actually actors and not necessarily a, a real patient or somebody who has actually had the disease. And I don't care if you have a thousand testimonials. That, to me, means nothing. The only way to know if a product is A, safe and B, effective is to do a clinical trial in humans. I don't care if something happens in a test tube. That does not necessarily translate to what's going to happen in a human being. And, and if you have something that happens in a laboratory animal, that is greater evidence, but that also doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to translate to what happens in a human being. So the plural of anecdote does not mean evidence. Okay. Next thing, they work in isolation. This is another big one. They say a belief is credible because it's endured for decades or centuries. Uh, on Monday in the U.S., we celebrated Columbus Day. And remember, in you know, the late 1400s, everybody thought the earth was flat. And Christopher Columbus were going to sail off the end of the earth when you know, he reached. And we know that's obviously not true. So just because a belief has been around for a long time does not necessarily make it true. Um, another thing what they'll do is they'll propose new laws of nature in order to explain how things work. And this happens a lot with, um, with many of the, the botanical products. And some of these um, uh, electric uh, vibration machines and things, they'll want to vibrate the cancer cells to death and stuff. It's just crazy. Okay. So on to the botanical agents. Huge proportion of, of the, the globe... Uh, does not have access to Western care, and so they use uh, botanical medicine as their primary source of medicine. Huge parts of, of India and China, so about 80% of the world's population uses botanical medicines. The CDC in uh, 2004 said 19% of adults in the United States used uh, botanicals, and the Sloan survey, about 14% of the population and 6% of those who use prescription drugs also use uh, herbal supplements. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Many of the cancer drugs that we use are derived from plants. You know, the taxol comes from the taxis tree, and the uh, uh, vinca alkaloids for uh, uh, vincristine, vinblastine come from the periwinkle plant, and, um, you know, the camphothecan comes from the mayapple and the podophyllin as well. So when we query uh, what the, the prevalence is in the oncology population, over half of the ovarian cancer patients in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, admitted to using botanical products. It seems to be much more popular on both coasts and less prevalent in the Midwest, at least right now in the U.S. About 23% of women with GYN cancers in the Midwestern uh, practice. Uh, depending on where you are in China, um, it's, it's very popular. 13% of women, this was back in 2000, and about 22% of women with breast cancer use the botanicals. Japan, many, many um, botanicals are used, and the medicinal mushrooms are very popular there. 
And one study showed that over 60% of the cancer patients use the mushrooms, and typically uh, it's in, uh, single mushrooms as opposed to the combination. Um, one study I found looking at Europe of 54% of the German patients who had lung cancer used uh, botanicals. 17% used multivitamin combinations. 15% used the mistletoe or iscador, which is very, very common in Europe. And it's not utilized, uh, we don't utilize it in, in um, the U.S. And 12% use selenium. When you query patients as far as why they're going to use it, a lot of them want to use for symptom control. Uh, sometimes they want to use it to treat active disease. A lot of times it's for preventing disease, uh, either preventing metastases or to boost the immune system. In uh, the U.S. in 1994, we had the DSHEA Act, the Dietary Health Supplement Education Act, and this took botanical supplements and nutritional supplements out of the realm of the FDA and made it available to everyone over the counter locally. And so the marketers cannot talk about treating disease. They can talk about treating structure and function, though. So you can't find something on, on the label. They can't talk about treating insomnia, because that's a disease, but you can talk about a sleep aid. Right? Uh, you can also talk about life cycle phases. So uh, menopause uh, is a life cycle phase, so they can talk about treating you know, things that will benefit hot flashes in menopause, uh, because that's not necessarily a disease entity. But cancer um, is a disease entity, and so many products have been actually removed from the market. There was a set of 19 different herbal teas that were marketed for treating cancer, and those were removed from the market. Um, <clears throat> so you find a lot of things about structure and function, a lot of things about boosting the immune system. Okay, that's a real popular thing right now. And uh, so that's a real nebulous term because boosting the immune system could either be immunosuppression or immunostimulation, depending on which part of the immune system you, you are affecting. So that, or a lot of times patients will do a, um, take botanicals just for general health. Looking at the Canadian use of dietary supplements, um, this data is old, but this is the most recent I could find. In 2005, there were 389 firms who were active in the field of the function of foods and pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals, and about $545 million in exports. In 2003, the estimated size of the Canadian nutrition sector was 4.83 in the U.S. equivalent dollars, and supplements were 1.31 billion from that. So it's, it's uh, huge, yes. But then in 2006, it bumped to 6.15 billion and an increase from 1.31 to 1.82 billion. Now, to put this in contrast, the, the right now, the two, in 2009, there were um, $23 billion spent in the U.S. alone on botanicals and nutritional supplements. $23 billion, okay, U.S. dollars last year. Um, in 2004, uh, the Canadian had the uh, Natural Health Product Regulations Act, and this, this uh, I think, was very beneficial for helping to uh, uh, help with the stability and the quality uh, assurance, which we do not have because of Deche yet. So there's a lot of uh, problems with herbs, you know, a lot of uh, faulty assumptions. First of all, that it's natural, that it's safe, which is just not true. Uh, not everything that's natural is safe. Arsenic is natural. That's not safe. Right? You know, we don't, uh, carbon monoxide is natural. That's also not safe. Um, so, and patients also believe that just because it's been around a long time and it's been used, that's effect that it's effective. And that's not necessarily the case either. You know, in China where uh, a huge portions of the, the population don't have access to Western care and they use their botanicals as their primary source, when you look at the comparison of the, the patients who use only the botanicals versus the, the patients who have access to Western care, the, the outcomes are night and day. You know? So just because it's been used a long time doesn't necessarily mean that it is of benefit or that it, it's helpful. It's just they may not have anything else, and so that's why they use it. Botanicals, we have to look at them as they are, which are they are unrefined pharmaceuticals, okay? They're, they, are, they are pharmaceutical drugs. Patients take them because they have an effect. That's why they use them. We have to be very mindful and make sure that the effect is what we want and that it's not an adverse effect and that there aren't uh, adverse herb-drug interactions. When you take a plant and you do an extract, if you don't get just one chemical constituent, like if you're giving propionyl, you know it's one single chemical compound. You get 
get hundreds if not thousands of chemical compounds from there. And what chemicals you get depends upon what you use as your solvent. If you use water, you get one. If you use uh, alcohol, you, you get something else. If you use um, CO2 extract under high pressure, you get, you know, different compounds. So it really, it very, it's very variable. We also know that botanicals, um, the components that we're interested in are what we call the secondary compounds. And these are things that the plants se secrete in response to stress. Things like too much rain, too little rain, too much sun, too little sun, the insects, the other populations, you know, the other plants that are around them stress. You know, they, they secrete these secondary uh, compounds, and those are the compounds that, that we utilize for the uh, botanical work. So these things, unless plants are grown in a greenhouse, and then you can completely control the conditions, there, there's batch-to-batch -batch variability, which can be a problem. We know wine varies from year to year. We accept that. Why we wouldn't think that botanicals would as well, you know, I don't know. So. All of these things in consideration, you have to think that botanicals are probably okay for the general public who are otherwise healthy, but probably for not, not for most cancer patients, and probably we have to be very careful about patients who are on uh, prescription medications as well because of the potential for adverse herb-drug interactions. And like I said, there's a lot of potential concerns, the contamination, toxicity, standardization, bioavailability. That's when you take a botanical is by definition some, is something that you take by mouth. And so bioavailability, just because you take something by mouth doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be absorbed and you're going to get s systemic effect. All right. Also, proper doses. Uh, many of the botanicals have not been studied in a rigorous manner, and so we don't necessarily know what optimal dose is these things. And optimal dose is different from maximal dose. When we do cancer drugs and many other things, we look at maximum tolerated dose. But for the, for the botanicals, and especially with immunomodulation, you're looking at optimal dose, which may be very different than maximal dose. Okay. In the U.S., we have the, the um, United States Pharmacopoeia, which is a, um, a verification process. And you'll see these uh, labels here on some of the, um, the drugs. Only about 5 to 10 percent of the, the um, over-the-counter botanical and nutritional supplements, the companies will send their products to this company in order to, um, to do the verification. It says nothing about A, safety or B, efficacy. It only talks about bioavailability and screening standardization so that what's in the bottle is the same thing that's what's on the label and there's nothing else added. All right. And then also uh, that they also test that they, the manufacturers use what we call GMP or good manufacturing pro processes, that there's not um, uh, rodent uh, excreta and rodent hair and, you know, a lot of, if, if, if the company is not sanitary, you know, there's animals and insects and things that can get in there because um, the, these are plants, right, the botanicals, and so you want to make sure that, that they use good manufacturing process. Consumer Lab is the second company that uh, d uh, does this verification, and so you may see the Consumer Lab uh, label if you're lucky on these products. Okay, so going on to anti-cancer supplements, uh, there's a lot out there uh, on the Internet. Uh, Laetrile uh, was used, uh, was very popular a number of years ago. This is vitamin B17, amygdalin, and actually the Natural Can National Cancer Institute have been doing some clinical trials on it. It was not shown to be a, a safe or be effective, and so it was withdrawn from the market. It's no longer used, but occasionally I do have patients that ask me about Laetrile, and there's a uh, minority of uh, firm believers in this as well. Asacac is, is something that's very popular. This is a herbal tea. It's from uh, Renee Casey. This is her name if you look here. Uh, it's Essacac is her last name spelled backwards. It's a combination of a uh, number of different herbs that's used as a tea. It doesn't work, and the problem is, is that it may uh, interfere with our, uh, but our traditional therapies. Okay. She was Canadian, actually. <laughs> um, it's popular. It's very, very popular. I get asked at least uh, two, three times a week about this. Um, so there's a lot of herbs that have promising anti-cancer effects uh, between turmeric, maitake, green tea, these things, and a few others. Um, so we're looking at it. Turmeric it comes from the, uh, it's, it's a rhizome. looks very similar to ginger, if you look at the ginger root, but, the, but it's smaller. 
and uh, it's from the curcumin longa plant. It's been used as a spice and a medicine in India and in China for many millennia. And it has two, two different components, the curcumoids and the tumorons. And a lot of these have uh, very, very potent anti-cancer properties and involving a number of multiple pathways, only one of which is the COX-2 pathway, so it's, it's uh, anti-inflammatory as well. It induces apoptosis in breast cancer in many, many different uh, cancer cell lines you can use it. Uh, the problem is, is that there's minimal bioavailability. Um, looking at this, you can, one study, they gave patients up to 60, 60, 60 capsules a day of the, the extract, and they were unable to get even one one-thousandth of the blood levels required to get the same effect that you see in the, the in vitro, the test tube studies. So very, very minimal absorption or bioavailability. Um, and when I was talking about the difference between um, animals and humans, when you do the bioavailability studies in the lab rats, the, the rats have about a hundredfold greater absorption of the, the curcumin than humans do. So even in a lab rat, you can, you know, they benefit uh, better from the, the, the curcumin than we do. So, so that's, that's very interesting. Um, they've tried a, a number of different modalities in order to increase the bioavailability, you know, adding uh, black pepper, piperinidrum, in order to, this is a vasodilator to try and increase the blood flow to the gut, try and improve the bioavailability. They're using nanoparticles. The researchers at MD Anderson have been working with uh, curcumin for many, many years, and they're actually working on an intravenous preparation, uh, which would obviously assure 100 percent absorption. But then once you start looking at IV and nanoparticles, this is no longer a botanical, then this is drug development and it's pharmaceuticals, okay? Which is not necessarily a bad thing, it's just it's not a botanical anymore, all right? And looking at, at if your patients are taking high levels of, of the extract, um, and maybe even the spice, it may inhibit, uh, because of the, uh, the antioxidant capacity, interfere with uh, chemotherapy agents such as cytoxan. The maitake mushroom, this is a wonderful mushroom. Uh, it's an Asian uh, mushroom from Japan. It's uh, very high in the beta-glucans, which is, uh, the maitake is the 1316 uh, side chain. There's a lot of immunomodulating effects in both preclinical studies, and we also have uh, uh, in both the in vitro and the animal models. Uh, it enhances bone marrow colony formation and also reduces the doxorubicin uh, toxicity in vitro. We've also done animal studies. Uh, we have one of the six NIH-funded botanical research centers, and uh, maitake is one of the, the uh, products that we're working with. And so for the last seven years, we've been doing extensive work with this extract, and um, we know that it also, with giving a, a Taxol, you get improvement in the neutrophil count and function. And it works through a GCSF uh, and GMCSF pathway. Doesn't seem to have much in the effect on platelets. I wish we had something that helped with platelets, but um, it doesn't. Uh, right now, I'm principal investigator and study looking at uh, the maitake in patients who have myelodysplasia, seeing if we can delay onset of progression of the disease. There's really no serious adverse effects or toxicities reported. In our dose escalation trial uh, with the breast cancer patients, uh, there was one woman who had a little bit of an itchy rash, and it was really not, not um, certain that it was from the maitake. Another person had uh, a little bit of diarrhea. There's, the beta-glucan is a fiber, you know, it's a, uh, one of those insoluble fibers that we learned about. And so you can, if they're taking high levels, you can get a little bit of uh, diarrhea with that. And when I talked about optimal dose, the optimal dose is three milligrams per kilo given BID uh, from our dose escalation trial. This is, and this was not the maximal dose that we tried, but this is the dose that we're using in our, our trial with the MDS patients. Reishi is another mushroom. Um, this contains the triterpenes, which are antioxidants, as well as the polysaccharides and the beta-glucans. There's a lot of benefit um, in uh, cell lines, including breast, leukemia, bladder, colon, prostate cancer, lines, um, looking at some of the drug-resistant uh, uh, small cell lung cancer cells with the, the reishi mushroom. It uh, reduced the IC50 for etoposide as well as doxorubicin. It does, like I said, it has the triterpenes in there which contain antioxidant properties, so you have to be mindful of which patients you're choosing this for because if their chemotherapy agent works through an oxidative process, and certainly radiation works solely through that, then it may potentially interfere. 
Uh, it also may impair uh, clotting, in, increase the prothrombin time, and it does have a hypotensive effect, so you want to watch that. The typical dose is 150 to 300 milligrams TID to QID. Coriolis is another mushroom, medicinal mushroom that I use commonly. Uh, trials in GI cancer and animal models are mixed, uh, but the human studies do show early benefit in both stomach and colon cancer, and, and I uh, use it uh, gingerly in some of my patients who have pancreatic cancer as well. There's two main forms that you find, PSP or PSK, and that again depends on which constituent solvent they use for the extract. Both are fairly similar. So I consider them essentially interchangeable. The uh, Chinese trials report a lot of benefit in stomach, colorectal, and non-small cell lung cancer. Again, it's tolerated very, very well. Uh, the studies have been negative thus far for breast leukemia and liver cancer. Um, it does uh, decrease the cytoxan clearance and increases your area under the curve. So if you're giving cytoxan, you want to be uh, uh, careful and not have them overdose. The dose is up to 15 grams a day, and this is high fiber. Uh, usually I use about 3,000 or 3 grams a day, and that's usually maximum of what patients will be able to tolerate. Otherwise, they end up with too much diarrhea, and then I'm concerned about malabsorption. Okay. Astragalus, another herb that we've used uh, at the Botanical Research Center, it's used uh, in traditional Chinese medicine commonly for lung ailments and shows uh, potent immunostimulating effects. It's got the saponins. Um, it also, the, these are very uh, uh, much immunomodulatory. They also have a lot of cytotoxic activity. Uh, one study they're showing that uh, Chinese herbal medicine, that the astragalus can affect uh, chemotherapy. We want to be careful. If you have somebody who has autoimmune disease or if you have somebody who has a solid organ transplant, you know, they have a, a kidney transplant, lung transplant, something like that, and if, you, and if they're on drugs for immunosuppressant to, to prevent graft rejection and you're giving them high levels of astragalus, you can induce loss of their transplanted organ. All right, so you want to be very careful. This is what I'm talking about. Boosting the immune system may not be a benefit for everyone, right? Someone has severe rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, autoimmune disease, and you give them something like this, you can induce a relapse in their disease. So we want to be mindful. Okay, milk thistle. This is used um, and used traditionally for alcoholic hepatitis and, and liver injury, and so patients have taken this, and so anything having to do with the liver, then they want to use milk thistle for. And um, so my colleagues up at Columbia, Cara Kelly and her team, they actually did a randomized control trial, very, very high-quality study, looking at 50 children who had um, ALL and who also had hepatotoxicity, and they measured, they gave them the, uh, the herb, for 28 days, so they measured their, their blood levels at baseline after 28 days and after 54 days. And the chemotherapy regimens that they used were the methotrexate, mercaptopurine, and the vincristine. They saw that there were no adverse or drug interactions with these three drugs. The dose was at 5.1 milligrams per kilo per day. And so they did three different dose batches, dose on weight. It was either 80, 160, or 320 milligrams a day. And they followed the liver enzymes. At, uh, Baseline and at, at day 28, there was no difference in uh, the two groups, but by day 54, there was decreased AST in the milk thistle group, and really not much in the way of uh, hematologic toxicities either was seen that was difference. There was less adherence in the milk thistle group, uh, mostly from GI upset and diarrhea, nausea, some abdominal pain uh, versus placebo. And when we look here, this is the AST, and you can see this is the milk thistle group versus placebo, and not much change here in the first uh, baseline or at 28 days, but at day 56 there was about, you know, one-third decrease, which is significant. You know, these are almost in the normal range here. ALT, not much in the way of difference. This was um, baseline milk thistle. Why they had higher ALT, I'm not sure. Of that was, they were randomized. Um, and then again with bilirubin, not much in the way of significant difference. So if we're thinking of different things with uh, herbs and lung cancer, I found one case report of uh, gefitinib activity was decreased with a combination, and I'm not real fond of these combination drugs because many of them are proprietary, and you don't know exactly the, the proportion of what's in there. But this was with ginseng and, and a few of the medicinal mushrooms, and, and many of them uh, can induce the, the cytochrome P453A4 system. And so uh, once this patient, they, they, they were responding to the gefitinib, and then they started this herb, and then the, the tumors blossomed as soon as they stopped it, then they, the um, 
they had uh, increased uh, gefitinib activity again and they saw tumor regression, so you'll need to be very mindful. Um, beta alanine. this has uh, been commonly used in China, and, and there was a report of over 20 RCTs on this, and so Cochrane actually did a review and back in 2007, and when they went back, you have to be very careful when you read the Chinese literature and some of the, the, the literature. Read it, keep, you know, with keep your skeptic hat on, because when they went back and they actually interviewed the principal investigators, 17 out of the 20 didn't they didn't understand the concept of randomization. And so they, they did, you know, allocation based by hospital, certain hospitals or by tumor types or whatever. They weren't, it wasn't a true RCT, what we think of. So they, they, after doing this, they said, we have no information. We can't comment on whether it's helpful or not because there have been no adequate <coughs> trials been performed. Okay, ACNO, this stands for anti-cancer number one. Okay, I kid you not. <laughs> okay, this is a 19 herb uh, Chinese comp formula, and there's six different varieties of this. It does carry a U.S. patent, and when you look at the, the, uh, the patent site, they say extensive testing indicates an effective treatment rate of 69.7% and 84.3% when used in combination with radiotherapy and chemotherapy. We don't, I don't have trials to, to, in clinical trials, you know, to back that up. But they do have a patent. Um, there's a lot of animal data. Um, that, that show benefit. I, when I went through the, this combination with um, Simon Young, who's our research pharmacist, he's in a unique uh, capacity to work with us. He's Chinese, he's an herbalist, he's an acupuncturist, he's also PharmD. So he treads both worlds. All right? he's, um, he's, he said that many of these herbs are commonly used in, in traditional Chinese medicine and none were no, known to be directly toxic as far as you know side effects in the, the in the concentrations used in the ACNO formulas, but we don't have studies showing potential of adverse herb drug interactions for many of our chemo drugs, so we're not quite sure, you know. So you want to be very careful if, if uh, your patients are thinking of using this. The, the, it's available in Israel, and, um, but they do have a U.S. patent for this. Okay. I do have one patient who, who has uh, uh, soft tissue sarcoma, who is not head recurrence and is not a candidate for other treatments at the present time. And he came to me and said, "Can I use this? This is, you know, how I found about this." And since there's no other options available at the present time, and the patient was interested in using it, um, I said, "Fine, you know, I'll help you. You know, we'll 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 monitor." And so I'm I'm using this, and we're monitoring, you know, liver functions and CBCs and coags as we would anything else, because you know, monitoring them closely. There are, is no other treatment available right now, and this um, may be a benefit. So down the road, I'll let you know <laughs> what we say. Okay, green tea, uh, very popular. Uh, one study looked at uh, EGCG with Tarsiva and in uh, non-small cell lung cancer cell lines, and the concentration was 10 micrograms per deciliter. And this actually, you could, you can work at it, but you can achieve this concentration in in a in a human. Um, and they showed that the uh, there was increased cell killing. Okay, this is control uh, EGCG alone. There are lotinib alone, and this was uh, the combination. So you did see definite benefit here uh, with that, and then also when you're looking at the uh, bar graphs. So that uh, may be of uh, benefit. But the flip side here, looking at uh, bortozomib and the boronic acid inhibitors in cell lines and in people here, the um, green tea, this was completely unexpected. The, that the molecule, the EGCG and the green tea extract molecules actually bound with the bortozomib took them out of, out of circulation. And so people were thinking, well, this is an antioxidant. You know, of course it'll be fine. It's just green tea, right? You know, or it's the extract. And the bortozomib, it's a monoclonal antibody. It's completely different mechanisms of action, so it shouldn't interfere. Well, unpredictable. Here we go, you know. And the patient's... Um, we're not having any side effects, and it was because they were, in effect, not getting their drug because the EGCG was taking it out of their system. And so we need to be very, very mindful, again, what we're doing, why we're doing it. You don't want to take the very best drug we have and have it work less well because we're doing something else. Uh, there are also was similar uh, interactions with uh, one, two dial groups, the vitamin C, iron, and quercetin. These are also very popular in the U.S. They didn't see much... Um, in interactions with the N-acetylcysteine, the butylated um, 
hydroxyl aniside um, glucathione or vitamin E. So it seems to be, this is, this is very specific for that molecule. Uh, this is looking at mistletoe, Iscador, um, with uh, ALL cell lines. Um, this is very commonly used in the U.S. A lot of the, uh, the parents of the pediatric leukemia patients want to use mistletoe. Like I said, it's used in Germany a lot, in Europe. Um, the, and I feel sorry for the children because they're at, at the you know, mercy of their parents, at the, and if the parents give them things, they don't really have... Um, permission to say no. And this is like exactly what you do not want to have happen. These are the normal cells, no, no um, uh, problem there, uh, no effect on normal cell lines. At the lower doses of the Iscador, you saw increased uh, cell growth, and it wasn't until you get to the very higher levels that you saw cell inhibition again, you know. So this is talking about optimal dose again, not what you want to see happen. Here's another, this is using uh, cat's claw and dragon's blood. Again, normal cell lines, no effect, but with the, um, the uh, dragon's blood, this is the, the white diamonds, 120%, and with the, um, the cat's claw, it was almost 140%, depending on the concentration, increased viability of your cell lines. So this is not what you want to have happen. Okay, PC specs, this was a proprietary herbal formulation of eight different herbs and uh, was given for uh, uh, prostate cancer. And this, when you think of it, when you actually look at the combination, it makes sense because there's, you know, different things that are, that are uh, estrogenic activity and, and things that um, help support the immune system and this type of thing. Um, licorice is a, is a phytoestrogen. Okay. And it, in the early trials, it showed benefit, but it was banned in 2002 because they found out that it was contaminated with DES, indocin, and warfarin. And so uh, it was taken off the market. Uh, so it stopped early. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, there's a couple of other formulas. There's PC Hope and PC Care. These are marketed, but they're really unevaluated, and I, I just would not recommend that. Okay, so our adverse herb drug interactions, antiplatelet activity, they can have hormonal activity. Many of the things that are marketed for, for the menopause work through an estrogen-like pathway. So for men, it may not be an issue. For women, uh, it certainly may be an issue if you, if you have, you know, ERP or positive breast cancer, or you have uterine or ovarian cancer, all right? Adverse interactions with the corticosteroids I mentioned, you know, boosting the immune system. You don't want to do that if you have autoimmune disease, solid organ transplants. Uh, you can see increased sedation. Um, a lot of times there can be problems with uh, just, just GI toxicity or liver and kidney toxicity, and then certainly additive effects when used with uh, opioid al analgesics, which many of our patients are on. The anticoagulants, vitamin E, garlic, ginseng, St. John's wort. St. John's wort is poster child of herb drug interactions. Almost every prescription drug has an interaction with. Um, and not all things are uh, anticoagulant, some are procoagulant, to CoQ10. This is commonly used, you know, for cardiac disease. Patients love it. it that may inhibit warfarin, and so you, can, you have to watch your proton closely. Garlic. I had a meeting with um, Dr. Kessler and I, our chief of medicine, had a meeting with the chief of hematology at Cornell last week, and she, her interest in, in herbs and botanicals perked up when she did a bone marrow biopsy on a patient who ended up bleeding out five units of blood. She said to him, what are you doing? Turns out he was eating 10 cloves of garlic a day, okay, for his heart. He had with an admitted and transfused five units of packed red cells. So these things are not always benign, even food, okay. Okay, hormonal therapies, breast, certain breast and ovarian cancers are sensitive to hormones. We know soy is a, is a phytoestrogen. Donkui, red clover, again, you know, wild yam, kudzu, very much phytoestrogen. Flaxseed, this is a source of omega-3s, a vegetarian source of omega-3s, so you want to be careful with that. Cinnamon extract, used commonly to lower blood sugar. I'm not talking about the cinnamon that you sprinkle when you're making your oatmeal or baking your cookies, but the cinnamon extract capsules. These are phytoestrogen, very highly concentrated. And the grapefruit seed extract, not the grapefruit seeds themselves, but when they do the processing and make it into an extract, it becomes phytoestrogenic. Okay, so we need to be very careful with those. Unless you think I'm anti-plant, I'm not. <laughs> like I said, we have one of the six NIH-funded botanical centers, and ours is on immunomodulators. And so we look at, at uh, many of these things. And we've now honed down into the medicinal mushrooms because that seems to be the, the, the um, most promising direction for immunomodulation now. 
Okay, so now antioxidants. Okay. A lot of confusion here and uh, with patients and uh, in the marketing, the ads and things. There's a huge difference between prevention, treatment, and survivorship. Prevention is primary prevention, secondary prevention. Antioxidants are great for protecting cells, okay? Uh, so they're good for primary prevention. But once you have cancer, they may not be in our best interest. And patients really confuse these areas. Right. And also, um, people want to do everything they can. And I think, well, you know, if I had a terrible diet now, you know, or I can't eat well, I want to, you know, make up for past bad behavior and poor food choices by taking massive doses of supplements. But it just doesn't work that way. You can't do that, you know. It's like you, you wouldn't plan on eating once for the year and then not eating. You, you want to eat a little bit every day, you know, right? You know, um, same thing with these things. You can't make up for decades of bad behavior by taking huge doses of something, you know. It just doesn't work. So antioxidants, like I said, primary prevention, they decrease DNA oxidative damage, and they work. But the radiation and many of the chemotherapy agents work solely through an oxidative process. So the, the doxorubicin, the platinum, platinum agents, uh, very, very common, cytoxin iphosphamide and some of the um, cytotoxic antibodies here. Okay. And we have to be careful because think you... We need some antioxidants. You need to have food, you know, what, what's the, the recommended daily intake. And many of the multivitamins, I can't recommend multivitamins to my patients, most of them, because they're high levels. These marketers and manufacturers don't understand 100%. It's all 1,500% of vitamin C, or it's 2,000%, or 20,000% of vitamin E, or, you know, vitamin A, high levels of these things. And, you know, they... they those are, are not helpful, but there's something in between which also may be harmful. We don't know. Maybe a benefit might be harmful. So we have to be careful. And the eating food, food seems to be safe. This is a, this is a plug for my next lecture. Come to my next lecture because we're talking about nutrition, nutrition and, and, and that. Food seems to be safe. But when you take something, taking a lycopene pill is not the same thing as eating a tomato, okay? You know, it's not. And taking vitamin E capsule, you take vitamin E, there are eight forms of vitamin E. You take vitamin E capsule, you're getting the alpha to go for a while. That decreases your gamma. So it's not surprising these studies show harm, right? Because, you know, you're, you're taking high levels and you're, you're doing it. You know, whereas if you're eating food, Mother Nature was very smart. The mix and matrix in food is, is different. And, and it's not just the the vitamins or the minerals, it's, it's the cellular matrix and everything else that, that work together that may be of benefit, you know, not just these isolated compounds, okay. So there's, there, the studies showing vitamin C uh, doesn't prevent cancer and can, uh, vitamin C can actually interfere when it's uh, taken even in high doses orally with uh, chemo agents. The SELECT trial, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that was stopped early because of adverse events. The physician's health study that used vitamin C and E, two by two factorial, that showed no benefit. We all know about the beta carotene in the male smokers, the carrot study and, and that, the vital study uh, used, depending on which study you looked at, it was 16 to 36 percent increased incidence in lung cancer in the beta carotene group compared to placebo, not what you want to see. Uh, there was a lot of studies looking at chemotherapy use concurrent to uh, antioxidants and 16 RCTs, only six had placebo control. None of these studies were powered to show any decrease in tumor response rate. And this is really what you want to know. You want to not just worry about decreasing side effects. You also want to know, am I affecting the treatment? You know, am I, am I causing adverse, you know, harm here? And most of these studies has less than 50 patients when it takes over 2,000 to really show a difference. Uh, and we had six recent authoritative reviews talking about this, this subject. Um, they did not recommend uh, use of antioxidants. One, one review did conclude that, that the antioxidants were safe, and this was published in a very low-quality journal. So uh, you cannot trust that one. Okay. This is, the, this is the, one of the best studies, and we probably aren't going to be able to do anything uh, similar to this in the future. This uh, was Barriotti and, and colleagues. Uh, they took 540 head and neck patients, and they randomized them to vitamin A and vitamin E uh, versus placebo, concurrent to radiation therapy. And again, you know, the group who had the vitamin A and E together, they had decreased side effects, but it came at a huge price. It was offset by 29% in the vitamin A alone and 56% in the, the vitamin A and E group with uh, a decreased tumor control, 
all right? Not what you want to have happen. All right? And, and the, the effect in smokers was even worse. You know, it was almost, uh, you know, three times the, the adverse rate in smokers. So you have to be careful. The SELECT trial, selenium vitamin E to prevent prostate cancer, huge study. This had uh, 35,000 men, phase three, RCT, 200 micrograms a day of selenium and 400 international units of vitamin E. These are things that are quantities that are found in your regular multivitamin, okay? Um, and they had to be at least 50 if you were African American, 55 elsewhere, and a PSA less than four, have a normal, normal rectal exam, and the outcome measures were prostate cancer incidence as well as lung, colorectal, and other uh, primary cancers. And this was stopped early due to adverse events. The vitamin E group alone had higher incidence of prostate cancer. The selenium group had higher incidence of diabetes, and the group who got uh, both had higher incidence of prostate cancer. The placebo group was null, that, you know, they were fine. So. Uh, Bayer uh, came out with uh, uh, one a day multivitamin for prostate health and that had selenium and vitamin E in it and they got into trouble because of their marketing and had to change their formula and now took that off. Okay. Our website, this is a wonderful website, please write it down. It's run by our, our um, MSKCC Integrative Medicine Service and um, it's free uh, access to, um, uh, we have over um, 250 different monographs. It's been in, in uh, use since 2002, and uh, we get over 5,000 hits a day. In uh, 2008, the New York Times Science Writers named this as one of the top nine uh, resources up with Na Nature Magazine, uh, Lancet, and the New England Journal of Medicine. We have over 250 monographs. It, there's two portals, one for patients and one for healthcare professionals. And anyone can access either portal and you can go back and forth. For the, the, uh, the patient portal, we start out with the bottom line. We have a one or two sentence summary, like this has not shown to be effective or th there's promising science here, or, you know, things like that. So the patients can actually figure out whether this would be helpful or not and get through the, the mumbo jumbo the science lingo. With the, um, for the healthcare professionals, that um, port uh, is, has live links to the abstract so you can read more. And if you have a question about something that's not on our website, please send us an email because we're always updating, we're always adding new monographs. And I guarantee you that if you have a question, there's probably a thousand other people who have the same question but just don't think to ask us. So please send us emails, we're, you know, we love it. All right. So our summary, the complementary therapies uh, can provide a lot of symptom control and decrease side effects of the cancer treatment. And many patients will use herbs along with stand standard cancer treatments. You need to discuss your botanical use with all patients. Most patients, if they're queried, they will tell you. They will, they will say whether they're using it or not. There was one study that actually looked at, at use and only 23% 20, of patients told their physician that they were using botanical supplements. And they asked, well, why didn't you say? And the number one reason was they never asked. So ask. Ask everybody, okay? All right. Uh, the botanical use, it has benefits, at, potential benefits and risks. And we also we need to know where to go to get uh, advice, okay? So with that, this is our picture of our, in our lobby of our integrated medicine uh, center. This is Dr. Kasselis, she's our chief of medicine. Uh, this is Dr. Deng, he's the other physician along with myself, that's me. This is Simon Young, he's in charge of our About Herbs website. This is Dr. Ed Keneally, he's a, bo a botanical uh, chemist, a botanist at uh, Lehman College. He works with us with our um, botanical center. And this is Dr. Chen, Yu Chen, he's uh, head of our acupuncture service. And, our massage therapists, our research study assistants, and, um, and everyone else. Okay, so thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take any questions if we have time. <laughs>
Okay, the, the, uh, that actually is most appropriate for my next lecture, which is on nutrition and, and uh, vitamin D. But the question was on uh, for patients who are not able to uh, take adequate nu nutrition, um, what do we recommend regarding uh, the B vitamins, B complex vitamins, and vitamin C? Um, the best form of vitamins and minerals, as you said, is food, definitely. Um, for my patients who are not able to obtain adequate nutrition, I can, there's only, in the U.S., there's only two different multivitamins that I can safely recommend that have only 100% of the recommended daily intake. And um, I don't necessarily want to say their names, but most of them are not appropriate. There, I, I do um, allow up to 100%. You have to be careful with folate because high levels uh, can have adverse events. But um, uh, the, the B, B complex is generally considered uh, safe. Uh, calcium may have, may not be, all right? Uh, but the, the B complex is generally um, okay. And I just, you know, again, you're going to be following them closely and watching for any, any um, adverse effects with this. You know. but, and, and then, of course, as soon as they can obtain adequate nutrition, then I want them to stop. You know, many patients, they, they just want it as an insurance policy, and I don't think that that's the best, necessarily in their best interest. Are you also, um, are you also looking at any um, The question is, am I looking at B vitamins in blood? Um, are you able to come to the next talk? <laughs> that would be better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when is the next talk? Well, thank you for asking. It's going, there's been a change. It'll be in, uh, uh, on the seventh floor in East. 7 at 3 o'clock. Okay. Okay, and we'll have an opportunity to really talk about nutrition, and I, I think we know yeah. your current interest. We have probably, we could ask, can we do one more question? Sean? Sure. No. No. Okay, that's it. I'm so it. sorry. Thank, Thank you, you very much.